Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so today, to start us off on maintenance, I'll talk about a idea that's been bubbling up, this idea of no time for the future. And this research started a little more than two years ago when I was in a rice farming vil village in southern China. And I was there to look at e-commerce. And you show up and you ask all the typical questions of the villagers, right? Like, how do you use this? And I was also really fascinated with this incredible rice farming system that's ancient. And it's basically a lottery system, so you have non-contiguous patties. You might have one patty that's lower and one patty that's higher. Because it's all natural irrigation, you have to constantly negotiate and collectively organize with your neighbors. So I thought this ecological way of creating a kind of, kind of political system was super fascinating. <laughs> But I got stuck in the village overnight, and you know, I was there. I was nice enough to be taken in by this old uh, rice farmer who is my host. And over dinner, he asks, why are you here? Why are you an American coming all the way to this place in rural China to just ask us a bunch of questions? And I had been traveling for quite some time at that point, and so I did start to wonder, why am I here, both physically <laughs> and existentially? So this question haunted me in the rest of my research as I went to Dinglo village, which is China's first Taobao village. And in rural Taobao land, there's no government, just the rules of Taobao. So Alibaba, the Chinese tech giant, makes a range of platforms. And Alibaba is most well known for Taobao.com, which is a huge e-commerce e site, which is like sort of like China's eBay, but there's no used items. And as of 2017, Taobao actually had 600 million monthly active users, which is twice Amazon's monthly active users. And you can buy anything on Taobao, from sheep's brains to fried dough, and my favorite, which is banned books and banned video games. And in order to bypass this kind of automated censorship, uh, people will hand draw covers. So Resident Evil, hand drawn. And these Taobao villages are becoming more and more common. So just in two years, the number of Taobao villages uh, quadrupled. And there's currently more than 3,000 Taobao villages in China. So this strategy is actually part of Alibaba, the company's bigger rural development strategy. So one focus is having rural citizens as consumers. And digital literacy is still low in some areas. So you show up to your village tab rural Taobao station, and you say, I want to buy some shampoo. I want to buy some you know, long underwear. And someone will help you purchase these on the website. The other focus, since in order to spend money, you need money, is having rural citizens as sellers. So basically having them manufacture or sell some, something on Taobao.com, whether it's rice or, as we'll see, uh, performance uniforms. And this isn't really a random phenomenon. It's actually what is reflected as the rural origins of Chinese capitalism. So what was really bringing about China's economic boom in the 90s was this kind of um, villages coming together and doing all sorts of wild economic experiments. Um, it also reflects a focus of the government more broadly, which is on rural revitalization. So thinking about industrialized agriculture and how you know, so much automation means that you need less people to farm. What are these people going to do? Um, also climate change, because so much of greenhouse gas emissions have to do with our food systems and how we're farming. Um, this kind of policy is also thinking more in the future about the environment. So for the Chinese government, the countryside is a very urgent issue. So in Dinglo village, there is a rural internet center. So I go, and across the street, you can see that it's still very much agricultural fields. And this village produces 70% of all performance uniforms in China. So by performance uniforms, I mean like things used for TV, for stage plays, for films. It's all kind of one-time wear. Um, they also produce like Santa Claus costumes. They're very busy around Christmas time because a lot of these costumes actually get exported to the US and um, across Europe. And over 90% of villagers uh, produce these costumes in some way, whether it is embroidery or um, testing out the giraffe hats. Um, you can see in the rural internet center, there's also uh, like Snow White costumes, other 
types of costumes that are more specific to China, like this monkey costume. It's an archetype. And this is done at the scale of home manufacturing. So what villagers will do is that in agricultural season, they'll be quite busy planting the fields, and those are in the back. And then in the front, they'll have their home workshops. Um, so like I said, they're busy around Christmas. They're also busy around Halloween. And this is the inside of the warehouse. So it's not quite at the scale where you see robot arms and you know, automation, but it's still people working at this level. And this is um, the inside of a home workshop. The couple lives upstairs, and they come down, and they go to work every day making these costumes. And so you see uh, this is the kind of process of manufacturing. So she's not making you know, tens of thousands, but she's making a couple hundred costumes at once. So I spent some time with one of these rural entrepreneurs, Ren Qingsheng, who is now the village party secretary. And he was one of the first people to bring e-commerce to the village. And he paved the way. He taught other villagers about how to put things onto Taobao. Um, he was voted in, actually, as the village party secretary. He said he didn't want the job because, you know, it's a lot of work. And he says he'll try his best. And he's very optimistic about what e-commerce will bring to the countryside and to his village in the future. He says that you know, 500 college graduates have returned home from the city to come be in the village and help on e-commerce, um, which is sort of unprecedented. And his own nephew, who was uh, doing very lucrative software engineering, returned home to help him on his e-commerce store. And young people are picking up farming again. Uh, what they're doing instead of planting wheat, which is the traditional crop of this area, is actually uh, planting cash crops like chilies. So it's crazy to me that a bunch of trick-or-treaters in the U.S. is causing more young people to plant chilies uh, in this part of Shandong. There's lots of things in Dinglo Village that are very entrancing and that I had never seen before, like this giant wok full of sesame oil, um, and also these cakes, which signal just how affluent the village is. You have um, hard currency embedded into the frosting. Uh, most Chinese villages are, a lot of them are still quite poor, so this was very surprising to me. But there's also quite a few things that don't exist. And so I noticed that nature did not exist there. Nature, not like, you know, not the way that we as urban dwellers think of it as some pristine wild wilderness. But instead, every single piece of land here was used in some way. There was nothing that was conserved or preserved. Every piece of land was put to work. There's also a complete lack of family boundaries in this vi village. Um, so this, grandmother is 99 years old and she's still working. She's helping pack and unpack uh, fabric, packages, you know, helping run the family business. And I was actually told a lot of old people find this very fulfilling because it gives them a reason to live, to financially contribute. Um, Ren Qingsheng, who was the first e-commerce entrepreneur, he actually started his business using borrowed family money. So this kind of uh, intra-family lending is very common throughout rural China and arguably throughout the rest of China. Um, it you know, can lead to a lot of drama between family members, as you might imagine, if your partner is sending money to their parents but not to your parents, and you know, all of a sudden money is missing. However, there is now Alipay, which is a mobile payment that has become very popular and widespread throughout China. So now you can sneakily send money to your parents without having your partner know. Um, everyone in Dinglo Village uses Alipay, and it's made, no surprise, by Alibaba. Um, it's actually now part of Financial, which is Alibaba's sister company. But it's a full-scale banking system. So you can put money in, you can invest money, it has wealth management services. Um, it asks a lot of its users, so it has facial recognition for security. Um, you can also plant trees to help offset the carbon that you might be using. Um, and what this really does is tighten control onto this one mobile platform. It mediates between the buyers and sellers on Taobao. Uh, it's a kind of escrow system to make sure that, you know, 
buyers and sellers don't cheat each other. But it is, for me, a kind of red flag that in this village you're paying for everything from pork buns to costumes with Alipay. Ren Qingsheng, the e-commerce entrepreneur, is now also shipping all across the world with the help of Alibaba and AliExpress, a site that dropshippers often frequent. Uh, this is my favorite uh, picture from, that I took in the village, which is, yeah, have you taboed today underneath the Communist Party flag? <laughs> so what dropshipping is, is you know, a company in the US or often in the West will provide a kind of level of branding and marketing, um, and they'll advertise certain items across Instagram or Facebook, but they won't actually keep any stock. And they will have the manufacturers in China directly ship that item to you. So there's some, you know, silly things on AliExpress, but there's also a lot of things that if you open up Instagram and it looks like some kind of shiny new lifestyle brand, a lot of those um, sites are drop shippers. And of course, um, these manufacturers are also starting to sell on Amazon because recent rules have made it easier for foreign sellers to put items onto Amazon. And when I get back to the US, I start looking on Amazon for Ren Qingsheng's items, and I do find one, and it feels like kind of a perverse thrill because in this giant global economic system where I'm never supposed to meet the person who made this weird costume, I did. It was like seeing a family member be famous or something. Um, there's other rural sellers that are becoming quite well regarded on Amazon. So this uh, infamous Amazon coat that went viral last year, that they actually have their factories in rural China. And of course, like I mentioned, the proliferation of thousands of small lifestyle brands on Instagram um, all draw upon this phenomenon of drop shipping, uh, this dispersed kind of manufacturing. So the way that I think of it is if Walmart was one era of globalization with their own factories, a monopoly, and kind of centralized industry on the coasts of China, I think the future points to a dispersed manufacturing in these smaller rural villages. So why look at this and why is this interesting? Well, for me personally, shopping means a lot. Um, I can remember that in 2011, after September 11th, George Bush took to TV to tell everyone, you know, keep calm, keep shopping. And in 2016, after the election of Donald Trump, the refrain from many on the left was, well, you can't do much about politics, but you can certainly vote with your wallet. And so I think there is something that is very deeply meditative, almost religious-like in shopping, in a world that is so interconnected with problems at a scale that I can't really understand or comprehend of rising authoritarianism, climate change, plastics in the ocean, political instability. The trick of shopping means that it makes me feel like I'm doing something about these problems in my choice to shop or not shop. And it feels like this very small choice is some kind of agency onto the future, onto the world as I want to see it, and some semblance of control. And so I scroll, I click, I read, I act, add to cart. And somewhere, not in Dinglo village, but another village in China, a very nice family is making a hand-carved bamboo toothbrush for me. And it feels great because it's a future of sustainability. It's eco-friendly. I can feel good about this. So I think back to the farmer's question, why are you here? And I realize that I ended up in rural China because I had to confront this idea of metronormativity. Um, metronormativity is this term um, coined by queer theorist Jack Halberstam to describe the dominant story of migration from the countryside to the city and the supremacy of the city as somehow cosmopolitan and the rural as somehow backwards. And for me, it feels very urgent to confront this. I realize that you know, this costume manufacturing, it's similar to so many other rural urban dynamics, putting data centers, coal mines, rare earth mines in rural areas. 
And I think tied into this is also the concept of time and of values. And the Chinese sociologist Fei Xiaotong once said that urban life, urban values, is defined by a series of obstacles that you know have, you have to overcome or somehow control in the future, that the meaning of life is always to look towards the future. But so when I talk to a local farmer in Dinglo, someone who hasn't joined the e-commerce craze, he tells me that the future is actually a concept created if you believe that everything in the present is imperfect. And he says that here in the fields, in the long dark of winters, the revelation that the universe is perfect as is. It is up to us to maintain this perfection. And there is no future because every day depends on precariously balancing the present. So in that moment, I understand that confronting metronormativity means to also confront my perhaps urban ideas of control and urban constructions of time. So what would it mean to you know, build a life without consuming objects, without inflicting this sense of control? I stop at a shoe stop. And unlike Ren Qingsheng, the seller here is very disgruntled. He complains to me, Alibaba sucks us dry. And because of the stories of Get Rich Quick, he joined in. But he sees this ultimately as a pyramid scheme and a scam. Because Taobao is free, the only money that the platform makes is having sellers buy ads. And so this shoe seller says it's a complete race to the bottom. There's no way he can keep up the good quality of goods while he's also paying so much money on ads. And there's other shoe sellers that are also lowering their prices. And more recently, Alibaba has plans to expand the rural Taobao strategy. They currently have outposts in South Africa and as well as Malaysia. They're calling it the World Trade Platform instead of the World Trade Organization. And as I leave Ding Lo, I look out onto the fields, and the shoe seller keeps on saying, it's all a scam. Thank you.